Okay, for this part of the lecture, we are going to be looking at basically the relationship between the cash crop, the cheap land, and cheap labor, and how that developed into the plantation system. The other thing that we're going to be looking at, it's not as complicated as it looks, but do want to get you familiar with these terms here. Looking at imperialism and capitalism to show how that created a need for economic and a moral acceptance of slavery. Um, so basically, just to break that down real quick, we're looking at the development of using state power to go out to other lands to extract the resources. So uh, for our purposes, we're looking at Great Britain going to Virginia to extract the resources of land to produce tobacco. That is going, for our purposes, going to develop into a slave trade over time, over a few generations. The thing you want to keep in mind, too, is in your discussion, you want to be sure to identify how that the, the background leading to Bacon's Rebellion, and well, there's a huge video on that within this lecture, um, and the significance of Bacon's Rebellion in regards to race and slavery. All right. So to get to the easy part, the plantation system um, is made up of a cash crop, which for our purposes in Virginia is tobacco, but in other colonies it will be rice, as in the Carolinas, right? Uh, there's sugar, there is indigo, there is hemp. Um, but Virginia, yeah, is mainly almost exclusively tobacco. Early on, the land was abundant and very affordable. It was free, um, and it was promoted through the head right system. And so the head right system was basically um, for every person you brought over, your family, indentured servants, uh, you were entitled, you were given 50 acres of land, right? And so the idea behind this was to make sure we brought English people over to the colonies. Um, keep in mind the idea for English people during this time is to create a colony for English people in in cre creating maybe the, the perfection of English civilization in the Americas was the idea uh, behind colonization of the Americas. They did not want to do what they perceived as the wrong way, um, what the Spanish and the Portuguese did, where it became a colony of, of mixed race people. And so, from the English perspective, the Portuguese and the Spanish corrupted their blood with, um, with West Africans and then indigenous people. They wanted this to be an exclusively English colony for English people. And so, the head right system was one tool uh, to promote that vision. Uh, cheap labor at first was going to be done through uh, indigenous servants, right? And again, indigenous servants is just somebody who would sell their labor for three, five, seven years in exchange for land tools um, and a weapon, usually, right? Uh, and this would, at first, would have been a dream, not even a dream come true for a lot of poor English people. It would have been a dream never even realized that would have landed in their lap. Right? The idea of economic mobility, social mobility, was foreign to to the English system. So a lot of these people were being freed from debtors' prisons and sent to the Americas. Um, and so indigenous servitude was the main labor source from the 16 teens all the way up through the 1670s. By the time we get to the 1630s, though, um, we begin to see the, the seeds of African, West African, race-based slavery emerge and so and by the time we get to the late 1670s we are going to see that completely institutionalized as the labor uh, force um we we're going to look slavery the, the thing you want to keep in mind is slavery slavery slowly develops um out of a need of chronic labor needs, right? And so as we saw in the last part of the lecture, we're just beginning to see the t t price of tobacco drop due to profits dropping um, because of this boom-bust economy. Um, you're definitely having this epidemic of overproduction by the 1660s. 
what's going to slowly begin to happen is slaves themselves will become a cash crop and this is fortified when the English actually get into the slave trade um, in 1672 and so they through the Royal African Company the Royal African Company founded in 1672 is the result of two things one the price of tobacco is dropping and so they need to address labor costs as any business uh, industry does and the other thing they have to address is this growing class conflict that is beginning to develop um, in Virginia you're having over from the 16 teens all the way to the 1670s you're talking 50 years of a huge labor pool of both white and black people or poor English and West Africans living together eating together and this is going to culminate in Bacon's Rebellion, which the next part of this video will go into. So do take the time to view that because that is a pretty substantial piece of history, Bacon's Rebellion, and the class conflict behind Bacon's Rebellion and how that intersects with race is an incredibly important piece of the puzzle and understanding um, how slavery developed and how it still continues to be relevant uh, in political discourse today and policy making and a lot of the um, critiques of the American justice system even to this day. So take a look at Bacon's Rebellion and do let me know if you have any questions. Go ahead and email me um, or get me on Sally. In this little video I want to talk about a very important historical event for purposes of our um, course uh, Bacon's Rebellion of, of 1676, 1676, so about four generations into um, this colony, Jamestown, Virginia, 100 years before the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Huge uprising that takes Jamestown, Virginia uh, down to the ground, burns it down completely. So the origins of this uprising um, occur with this guy right here. His name is Nathaniel Bacon, and he came over to Virginia around 1676. He joined the House of Burgesses. He is a um, an aristocrat, very elite, landed, young too. He's in his mid 20s, and he notices something right away that he's able to exploit, or at least he attempted to exploit, which was that there was a large class of white English um, people, poor, uh, disenchanted with their position in life. Um, and they were disenchanted for the position in life due to the reasons that we've talked about. They were indentured servants, and they were promised, obviously, land, uh, tools, a little bit of money, weapons, uh, to get started once they finished out their contract. But typically they would be given land in this kind of area right here. Let me show you. So if you notice in this area, in the Chesapeake area, this is where the big rich land uh, plantations would be. This is where indentured servants and slaves alike would go to work. And if you were an indentured servant, if you were lucky enough to finish out your contract, you would get land out in this area up here away from water areas and areas near a mountainous region probably where the land would be rocky and not as fertile as it would be in a more arid water um, approachable area in, in this region right here and so these people would have no choice but to go probably further west inland to find some land that they could do something with and if they got, went too far west, they would run into these folks right here. These would be the Dogue Indians right here, um, that English settlers uh, and former African indentured servants as well would run into seeking to find other, other land. And typically these people would not want other people to settle on their land, so skirmishes would happen, conflict, conflict would happen. So. Dogue Indians might kill some white settlers, white settlers might kill Dogue Indians, 
and pretty soon the House of Burgesses would have a problem on their hand out in the, um, the frontier area, this region right here. So out in, in, in the frontier areas, this area right here, right? And this would create inherent instability in the region. And that's bad for business. It's bad for property values. It's bad for future investment. And so members of the House of Burgesses in Jamestown would not want that kind of situation happening. So pretty soon, uh, prior to 1676, you had restrictions on where white settlers, English settlers, or I should really use the word English settlers because the word white wouldn't have been used back then. English settlers could go, right? because they want to avoid future skirmishes with these folks right here, the Dog Indians. And so when Nathaniel Bacon comes into this area, he notices this, this conflict that's brewing. And again, he wants to exploit this for his own personal gain. And so he goes to this guy, Governor Berkeley, um, and explains to him th the situation. So Governor Berkeley, this guy right here, so this fellow right here, Governor Berkeley, explains the situation. Governor Berkeley obviously is well aware of the situation, and he says, I understand, because what, what Nathaniel Bacon's big problem here is, hold on a second, let me bring both of their images up, is that Nathaniel Bacon would contend that English people shouldn't have to take concessions, shouldn't have to compromise with um, Native Americans, Dogue Indians, right? English people are above Indians here. And Governor Berkeley would say, yes, I agree with you, young man, but you don't understand where you are at. We are surrounded, not just by the Dogue Indians, but by the Powhatan, by a host of other Native American tribes that if they wanted to, they could plan an attack. They've done it before, and they could do it again. Um, so we need to play ball right now. And if the population increases, perhaps, yes, we could in, we could uh, take their land in the future. Berkeley, this guy right here, wants nothing to do with this, and he quickly forms a militia of this discontented people. And he goes after uh, the Dogue Indians and some other uh, tribes as well, making war on the people. When Governor Berkeley, when this guy finds out about it, he's furious. This guy, the, what, how he sees it is Nathaniel Bacon is is possibly completely destabilizing this entire region, and this cannot be tolerated. So he sends out a militia to confront Nathaniel Bacon's army, and what is peculiar about Nathaniel Bacon's army is that it is made up of both poor English people, white folks, and poor African people, right, black people. And this would have been a normal occurrence. This would have been expected at this time. This wouldn't have been shocking. But something does get exposed here. You notice right here, in a depiction of Nathaniel Bacon's rebellion right here, you can tell that these are um, uh, African descended people fighting in this rebellion here. Um, the, again, this would not have been a surprise, but what gets exposed here is that we do not have a group of people that are viewing each other racially. The members of Bacon's army were poor. That's what they had in common. And it exposed a greater reality that, that, that members of the House of Burgesses were certainly aware of. But it had come like so many things that humans do. They put things off to the last moment until there is a crisis. And this is indeed was a crisis. Jamestown was burnt to the ground. Nathan, um, Governor Berkeley narrowly escapes with his life. It, for all exten extensive purposes, the rebellion was successful, except Nathaniel Bacon contracts dysentery and dies shortly thereafter. The... the and then the, the army was uh, rounded up by the British Navy, and its ringleaders were summarily um, arrested and then executed. And so it was suppressed. But what this, um, what this, um, what this made clear to members of the House of Burgesses and to the Parliament in London is that that 
what was created in Jamestown could not be duplicated in other colonies, and it needed to be redirected within uh, Jamestown, Virginia, and throughout Virginia. And that is, they had created a powder keg of a, of a community of people that were class-oriented. So white and black people, for the first three to four generations in Virginia, they slept together, they ate together, they had families together, they got drunk together, they ate together. They saw each other as the same people with the same problems uh, and common interests and common enemies. And so what begins to happen after Bacon's Rebellion is that previous laws that were on the books uh, that were largely ignored that differentiated race would be now enforced and other laws that would differentiate race would be introduced and enforced and so it becomes illegal for white and black people to marry it becomes illegal even in in common law it had always been considered illegal, but even in common law, it would become illegal. It would be illegal to have children together. It would be illegal uh, for for white and black people to, to live together. Uh, separate punishments would be enforced. So if a white person was to run away as an indentured servant, he might just get one or two years. If a black indentured servant or slave was to run away, he would become a slave for life. This is still when slavery is in transition here, and you have um, people aren't clear of how long should a person be a slave. Well, by the time 1676 rolls around, it becomes quite clear who is going to be a slave and how long they're going to be a slave. To be a slave means to be black, and to be a slave means to be a slave for, for life. At first, these laws would have, been re would have been resented by the lower classes of people. But given another generation, by the 1700s, by the time you get to the early 1700s, both poor, middle class, and rich English people, white people, now we can begin using that term, white people, by the time we get to the 1700s, understand themselves to be biologically superior, biologically superior, since that's what the law reflects. And what begins, what's probably first understood is that the law was a cynically imposed law by a bunch of rich uh, landed elite folks who were just trying to entrench their power. But give it 25 years later, and a new generation of people are born into this, Obviously, the law is reflecting a, a natural law, that white people are superior. And if you're poor and you're white, your life can be uh, dismal. It could be discouraging. But at least you have your white skin. And that white skin gives you the possibility that if you work hard enough, maybe one year you could get slaves. And if you work even harder, Maybe you can get more land. And maybe if you work really hard, you could be like that rich white plantation owner uh, who's got the good life. You just have to work a little bit harder and, and luck has to get on your side, right? Bacon's Rebellion, hugely significant event that in tandem with a lot of other events like the Stono Rebellion um, and with changes in the economy, that is indentured servants becoming more expensive, because there's less of them, and the slave trade becoming more uh, accessible to the English colonists. In tandem with all of that, Bacon's Rebellion also is a determining factor of institutionalizing not only slavery in British America, because again, it's a gradual thing, and at first the British colonists were dead set against having slaves, but it's also a mechanism that creates the concept that we're very, very much familiar with today, race. That is white versus black, black versus white. That conflict that definitely exists today and establishes this thing called white identity and, and white supremacy um, throughout colonial America and all through American history to this 
to this very second, as we see manifest through images of Trayvon Martin and, and what's going on in Ferguson. We hear lots of people, whether one agrees with it or not, looking at the legacy of white supremacy in this country and how it still manifests today. Okay, so what I have to conclude this little lecture on Bacon's Rebellion is a clip on a gentleman named Anthony Johnson, um, who was a who was one of the original uh, slaves brought on the Dutch ship to Jamestown in 1619. He survived the Powhatan attack in 1623 that almost wiped out Jamestown, and he grows to prominence. He becomes a rich landowner. Um, he is well respected within the community and uh, he lives a very prosperous life. But within his lifetime, uh, he gets to, as he becomes older, he gets to see the establishment of white supremacy and the degradation of anybody who had um, African descent, including his children, into a permanent second-class citizenship. So watch the story. The whole video is available um, in the notes, and I think I might even put it within the lecture page as well. Um, so you can watch the whole video. We'll probably watch it in class as well. But yeah, take a look at this, and we'll talk more about it later. The prosperity that began in 1619 and the dream of a new Eden, a people peacefully coexisting under English law, was fiercely opposed in March 1622. On Good Friday, some 30 nations of the Powhatan Confederacy, angered by English violation of land treaties, attacked the Babylonians and attempted to drive the English back into the sea. Along the James River, the Indians killed 350 colonists. On the Bennett Plantation alone, 52 people died. Among the 12 who survived was a man named Antonio. Here's an individual that arrives as one of the first African Americans in the history of what became the United States. He does what almost no one in early Virginia managed to do, and that is live. Everyone that's dying of disease, violence, and in a sense, he's lucky. He had been brought to the colony the year before to work tobacco along the James River. His name appeared in the 1625 Virginia census as Antonio Anigua. He was listed as a servant. He comes to Virginia, finds a society that is just developing. Is getting in on the ground floor, as it as it were. Um, I don't know if he was able to immediately envision that there would be opportunities for him here that uh, weren't available elsewhere. I don't know that anyone could have foretold that. When Antonio arrived, the laws of Virginia did not as yet define racial slavery. They governed only the status of servants. At some point, Antonio changed his name to Anthony Johnson and married a Negro servant named Mary from a neighboring plantation. She bore him four children. By 1640, it is clear Anthony and Mary were no longer servants. They had acquired their own modest estate on Virginia's east shore. As Johnson prospered, as he obtained land and cattle, he also acquired dependent laborers. What made all of this society go was property. Your identity in the society was determined rather obviously by the amount of land, the amount of labor that you own. Anthony Johnson was enjoying privileges belonging to a free Englishman. He claimed five workers as head right and expanded his property to 250 acres along the Pontesque Creek. At least some of his workers were white. By 1660, Anthony was one of 400 black people in Virginia out of a population of almost 19,000 settlers. In Northampton County, where Johnson lived, nearly 20 African men and women were free. 
and 13 are in their own homes. As Anthony Johnson is accumulating property, it seems as though the situation is secure. You get a sense of this individual, this black man being treated like any white planter and his wife and daughters being treated like the wife of the planter. At an early moment when men and women were sorting themselves out, when the rules, the etiquette of race, labor, were not so clear. At this moment, in one county in Virginia, it was not, it was not foreordained that race relations would become what they did become. In 1640, the year Anthony Johnson purchased his first piece of land, three servants had run away from a Virginia plantation and headed for Maryland. Captured and returned to their own, they were tried for breaking their contract. The said three servants shall receive the punishment of whipping and to have 30 stripes apiece. One called Victor, a Dutchman, the other a Scotsman called James Gregory, shall first serve out their times according to their indentures, and one whole year apiece after, and after that to serve the colony for three whole years apiece. The third being a Negro named John Punch, shall serve his said master or his assigns for the time of his natural life. Jamestown Court Recorder. The time of his natural life. According to all the legal records that survive, no white serving in America ever received such a sentence. So what begins to happen in 1640 is that those who are controlling the Virginia colony say to themselves, the fluidity that we've seen in the past, the fluidity that has allowed an Anthony Johnson to serve less than the life term to acquire his own piece of land, to develop a free status, is not something that we want to project as going further in the future. We want to close down that opportunity. We want to begin to show some distinction. The English definition of who could be enslaved began to shift from non-Christian to non-white. For Anthony and other Africans in America, the idea of an equal chance in the colonies was now under attack. In 1641, Massachusetts became the first colony on the British-American mainland to recognize slavery as a legal institution. Connecticut followed in 1650, Maryland in 1663, New York and New Jersey in 1664. Virginia legally recognized slavery in 1661, and a year later, a Virginia court decided that all children born in the colony would be freed or slaves according to the condition of the mother. In Virginia, slavery would be defined by race and perpetuated through heredity. Perhaps in the middle of the 17th century, if you were one of several thousand Africans living in Virginia, uh, you certainly knew that your children would would uh, be free, you might have that expectation. And to suddenly find themselves involved in lifelong servitude and then to realize that in fact their children might inherit the same status, that was a terrible blow. That was a terrible transformation. Also suffered in poverty, were the thousands of free men, mostly poor and enlisted servants, who were unemployed and broke. Now, the 
Congress to withdraw. The problem they face is not only a decreasing supply of indentured servants, but they face this increasing problem of what to do with all these indentured servants once they live out their term. And a lot of them were surviving. They had to be given land. They had to be given their freedom dues. One of those dues included even guns, and there was a lot of unrest in Virginia. In 1661, servants rebelled in York County. Two years later, Gloucester County authorities foiled a plot by nine servants to steal arms and ammunition and march on the seat of colonial government. In 1676, the unrest in Virginia exploded into civil war. An army of 500, free men, servants, and slaves rebelled against the colonial establishment's restriction on available land. They attacked peaceful Indians, ransacked property, and burned Jamestown, sending the government into hiding. This disorder that the indentured servant system had created made racial slavery to southern slaveholders much more attractive because what, what were black slaves? Like? Well, they were a permanent dependent labor force who could be could be defined as a people set apart they were racially set apart they were outsiders they were strangers and in many ways throughout the, the world with, with a couple possible exceptions slavery has taken root especially well when the people who are enslaved are defined as strangers as outsiders and can therefore be put into an inheritable permanent status of slavery I understand there are some slave ships expected into York River now every day. 